These are the kings of the bridge world. The great suspension bridges enable engineers to span distances once thought impossible, conquering nature and captivating those who cross them. If a bridge is designed well, that elegance of that math, of that science, shows up and triggers something in us that says, gee, that's, that's right, that works perfectly. New York City. Before the turn of the century, it was already big and booming. Its islands begged for bridges to help cope with the traffic and keep the big city economy growing. When it opened in 1883, the Brooklyn Bridge was the longest suspension bridge the world had ever seen. Its main span of almost 1,600 feet set a new record. Before the days of computers and sophisticated machinery, it was sheer ingenuity, manpower, and daring that got the job done. In the time the Brooklyn Bridge was built, structures that high that are 200 feet or so above the water, structures that span that kind of distance were unheard of. It was unthinkable to build anything that big. Uh, it was the equivalent of the moonshot of 1969, going back almost 100 years. Steel came into use in the early part of the century, and, and along came Roebling and uh, came up with a design for steel cabled bridge. Engineer John Roebling relied on new techniques that made it possible to bridge greater distances. As foundations to support the massive granite towers, he used pneumatic caissons. Two airtight timber boxes, half as big as a city block, were sunk to the riverbed and filled with concrete. Roebling devised a method of threading and spinning thousands of miles of cable back and forth between the towers. A traveling wheel like this one on the Golden Gate Bridge was used to shuttle individual wires from one end to the other and connect them to the anchorage. Each wheel carried two wires across. But today, there are many wheels and several wires in each wheel, so six or eight wires are carried across. The idea is the same, but the application is speeded up a little bit. Roebling also introduced slanted cables, known as stays, along with vertical cables that support the deck. They lead from the tower to the roadway to steady it during heavy winds. The idea of cable stayed bridges started here. Today, when somebody thinks about adding stability to a bridge, they might do exactly what he did. You'd say, wow, isn't that a modern bridge that you see in Europe or South America where you see cable-stayed bridges? In fact, Roebling thought about that before then. And that gave it stability. But as suspension bridges became longer, engineers learned one of their biggest lessons from a narrow two-lane span at the other end of the country. In an attempt to build the ultimate slender suspension bridge, its designer failed to account for a constant 40 mile an hour wind. Pressure from the wind triggered huge oscillations, as well as an incredible torsional or twisting motion. People who used the bridge were literally getting seasick. They compared it to riding a wave. Here it goes. Four months after it opened, the wave crashed. This Comaneros Bridge is a very classic example of having a very bad shape with regard to wind. The very blunt surfaces, the wind attacks, and it has almost like fluid water moving around a pier, creates eddies, oscillating actions then start, and in this case, threw the bridge into a resonance, which eventually collapsed it, all under very small wind forces. There was very little stiffness built into the bridge to account for the pressure. The deck could have been wider, the towers could have been thicker, but most of all, engineers ignored aerodynamics. They now design long suspension bridges with horizontal girders that are open along the sides to let the wind pass through. That's the case with New York's Verrazano Narrows, the longest suspension bridge in the United States. 
It connects Brooklyn to Staten Island. Its main span stretches almost 4,300 feet, roughly the length of 14 football fields. <laughs> 